man, I don't know who these people are. I don't. Right. I wish, hey man, look, sometimes I do wish I scripted them. They look, yeah, 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 yeah. I just take whoever's sitting in my chair and I take them for whatever they've been through, for whatever they're going through. But I want to show that it doesn't matter because at the end of the day, who don't love a crispy right. lineup? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Loyalty is not when you, when you have no options and you stand next to somebody. Yeah. Loyalty is when you have options and then choose to stand next to somebody. Mm. You know, when we got no options, we all sit around broke. It's like, yeah, we got nothing. Where else you gonna go? <laughs> Someone needs a real conversation. There needs to be a real conversation in this chair. That's not happening. Man, he put his shirt on wrong. It's gonna be done. Smeared. Smeared. Appreciate you for tuning in in this episode of Funky Friday. Make sure you like, subscribe, and share this. And if you're feeling really funky, leave a comment. Enjoy the show. Yo, what's good? What's poppin'? What it is, what it ain't, what it could be, what it should be, what it would be. Cam Newton, the son, Mr. Boogie, the all. And I promise, I really do promise to give good content for the masses. But most of all, I promise to keep it funky for your asses. Now today, this young man, you may have seen him on... Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, either by his page or somebody else's pages of the positivity that he's done, a social media influencer, a barber by trade. I present to some and introduce to others, a Vietnam uh, <laughs> representative. You dig? Vic Glenn's my guy. My brother, man. Thank uh, you, bro. How you doing? Appreciate the hospitality. Thank you for welcoming me here, man. Absolutely. So, you know, we was, we was getting into you know, just the whole flow of everything. And I don't like to use, and I, I shared this with you, I don't like using the podcast kind of title. I just love Candid Conversation. There's no box. You know what I'm saying? No box over here. We just and talk. And the more questions that you have for me, this will eliminate the, the pulling from me trying to get out of you. But for people who've never seen or heard of, of, of Vic, like this is a person who is very... He uses his platform for positivity, not like a lot of people using it just to for the like or the tweet. Um, I was drawn to you because it's it's needed in this world today. The love and 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 the give a mentality. You know what I'm saying? Like when you're giving people haircuts and you're asking questions, it, it it's like you care. You know what I'm saying? And you're finding about that person which makes you, whether you agree with them or not, you are able to agree to disagree. You know what I'm saying? So how do, how do we come about to get an idea of the content that you create? Oh, first of all, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, for real. I mean, it's a lot coming from you, man. Growing yes, up sir. in North Carolina during your heyday was an experience, bro. Yeah. For real. And I was actually working at a, in the sports bar during that time. Wow. So believe me, I've seen every Cam Newton game every Sunday yeah. in North Carolina, in the Ville, working as a server. So to hear that from you, my brother, means a lot to me. Yes, sir. Uh, but coming up with the content that I make now, I mean, you answered a lot of what I was going to say anyways. Mm -hmm. You first, you got to love what you do. You know, I love being a barber. I love giving somebody a haircut. I love connecting people. I love to speak. I love community. Mm -hmm. I want to impact. And the reason I want to impact so bad is because I didn't see a lot of it for myself in my age. Mm. And people that I would see, whether it was where I grew up at or what I was seeing on social media. So my inspiration to even go out to give a haircut to a stranger was to connect us mm. and to bring us together and to show how common the things that you go through that you think are uncommon mm. really are. You walk this life and you feel alone sometimes, but I'm telling you, man, everybody that walk next to you going through the same thing. Right. And sometimes a, a conversation is what needs to, that needs to happen. More than often, a conversation is always needed mm -hmm. to happen in every situation in this world, but I'm grateful that God blessed me with a gift like barbering that I could spark that from anybody. Right. Because everybody sits down in the chair, whether you got a barber, you got a stylist, you got a braider, you got a cosmetologist, everybody sits in the chair. Mm -hmm. And conversations that happen in the chair amongst our communities are some of the most important and special ones that we've ever had in history. Mm. So I'm grateful to, to have started it that way, but leading with my heart first was the first thing I had to think about. Right. So even then, like, how long have you 
been doing the trade of, of barbering? I've been cutting for a total of six years. I started at 17. Mm -hmm. So it was supposed to be a side hustle for me. I was going to go to college and I was going to cut in the dorms for 10 mm -hmm. bucks, five bucks. I didn't have a concrete plan, nor did I originally see that my life would open up through barbering. Originally, when I first picked it up, because mm -hmm. the only reason I first picked it up because my barber G over there at Barber Kings and Hope Mills said, yo, Vic, if you learn how to cut hair, you can make money for the rest of your life. Mm. So the second that I heard rest of my life and money in the same sentence, the hustler me at 16, 17 years old, I had to see how much I can make. Yeah. <laughs> I, I had to test it. If someone told me I can make money for the, man, if you told me I can make a dollar a day for mm. the rest of my life, I'm going to make a dollar a day. Right. If you told me I can make a, a 50 cents a day, I'm going to figure out how to do it. So I was always a hustler growing up, making my own money. I've been making money and hustling and being an entrepreneur for a long time. Uh, I never sold drugs. I never wanted to be, you know, no street dude or anything like that. Right. Like I just wanted to provide. You know, my dad told me from my early age that a man is to provide. Mm -hmm. uh, so at 14, that was the last time that I had took money from my parents. You know, because my dad was just telling me, like, hey, man, a man don't, like, ask his mama for money all day. Yeah. And I'm like, man, well, if I want to take Shorty to the, uh, to the movie theater, yeah, yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I got to find out how to get $8. Yeah, yeah. So I started figuring out how to get $8 a, a weekend, like a day. I would go to Putt-Putt, and I would steal a putt, and I would go, like, take money out the pond. Mm -hmm. And I would just walk the park, and I would look on the ground all day. And I'll find $8. Right. I may have had the other eight, but I would, I would just... I would just get my own money. Right. You so, know? That, so that hustles mentality that you have, is it instilled in you or is it taught? It's instilled in me and it's taught for me from my parents. Mm. My dad is Puerto Rican and he's from Boston. Boston. Yeah, my dad's from Boston. So mm -hmm. that's, you know, why I grew up a Boston sports fan as well. But my mom is from Russia. She's, a, she's, a, she's an immigrant. She, you know, first in her family to ever live in America. Wow. Um, and my dad had met my mom in Korea. My dad was in the military. My mom was working for a Russian airline company. So they met in Korea mm. somehow, some way. And after less than a year of my, of my dad knowing my mom, he proposed to her. Mm. Went and got my, my, bro my older brother and my mom and said, come on. Like, what? Yeah, so my Are dad- Are you bilingual? My, nah, nah, I'm not. Mm. I could have been, I mean, it sounded like I could have been trilingual, but you know, my mom had, to, you know, she took the sacrifice to be there with the family. She put her dreams on hold for my dad and for the family. So my mom needed to learn English. Mm. And, you know, my mom knew English working at her job. Um, but I couldn't imagine, you know, her coming to America and us speaking Spanish in the house or whatever, yeah. you know, it would just be like, why? Yeah. You know, why, why would we do that? And, you know, as much as we would have loved to learn Russian, mm -hmm. uh, my older brother knows Russian. He's full Russian. Um, and, you know, they speak in the in the language, but you know, more than often we was in America and things were running fast. So Absolutely. I have an opportunity later. I'll figure it out. Yeah. So the thing that I want to kind of highlight right now is the outer realm of what a person may see when they see Vic Blends, right? Tattoos, young, vibrant. Um, some would say rapper. Some would say whatever, right? Very articulate very intentional and I would say wholesome to the degree of like, you know who the f you are, you know what I'm saying? Um, as you're merging or going through life in this, in, this tip, in this typical way, how are you able to find your identity in this world of chaos? Man, finding your identity is hard. Mm -hmm. It's probably one of the hardest things that I had to go through in my own life, uh, you know, for being as young as I am. Uh, because when you grow up in a place, a special place like Fayetteville, North Carolina, you're at a melting pot of a lot of different things. Mm -hmm. I'm in the South. Man, I grew up in the South. I grew up, you know, in a small country, surrounded town. My dad's in the military. I was born in Germany. I went to Texas, to Germany, to Deville. Mm -hmm. Growing up in Fayetteville, having military and so many different people that come through Fayetteville, whether the military or not, or, they're, you know, they're, they're native there. And then you grow up, especially in the area that I grew up in, which is a lot of social media. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of things that you see that don't represent where you're from, what you like, and you just don't see them exist or live in your surroundings. Right. So I've always been into a lot of different subcultures. Mm -hmm. First thing I ever wanted to be in my life was a pro skateboarder. What? Like I, 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 I could, I mean, yo, I don't, I mean, a lot of, a lot, a lot of people in this world that can't beat me in the game of skate. Like mm -hmm. I. Wanted to be a pro skater. I love skateboarding culture. 
Um, you know, I got to Fayetteville and there was only one skate shop, DeVille Skate Shop on Bragg Boulevard. So like I first came to Fayetteville, there's only one skate shop in the whole entire city and it's in a rough part of town. So I got to go to the skate shop for three years straight in middle school, sixth to eighth grade. And that was where I learned to make friends or get into the city at. You know, I'm a big fan of wrestling. I love wrestling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like Jeff Hardy is, you know, one of the yeah. biggest <laughs> legends boys. ever, Carolina legend at that from Cameron. So I've always been into wrestling, skateboarding, hip hop was prominent in my life mm -hmm. early. I love hip hop. My brother used to burn CDs as a hustle. My brother's actually your age. So mm. my older brother burned CDs in high school and sold them. Yeah. First CD I ever picked up was 50 Cent. And I, and I, and I asked Get my Richard brother. Did Richard not try? If, uh, lo which one Lollipop was on? That was a song I listened to. Mm. Whatever, which one Lollipop, whatever album Lollipop, because I don't know 50 uh, discography, but that was the first, like, I remember asking my brother for, my brother's friend for a CD player. And his friend brought me a CD player. I didn't have no music. He just gave me an empty CD player. So I'm like, how'd he give me a CD player with no music? Right. So my brother's at school. I just went in his room and just took the first thing I could. He had a full shelf of burnt yeah, yeah, CDs yeah, yeah, everywhere. Yeah, yeah. I just cut the first one. I knew 50 Cent. Yeah. Put that lollipop on, man. Or, yeah, I put that, man, I put that, uh, the candy shop. No, candy shop. Lollipop, uh, Wayne, candy shop. Mm -hmm. Took it to the candy shop. First thing I put on was candy shop. Like, lit my lollipop. Like, yeah. yeah. Right, right, so, right, right, I remember right, right. my dad taking my thing at the crib. Like, yo, what the, you know, what is this, bro? Like, taking my, uh, my head off my CD player. But, you know, even that, like, me and my dad was in a rock. Mm. Like, I love rock music, heavy metal. Like, I love all music. Mm -hmm. I'm very inclined by music. Um, and I've been blessed to be able to grow up even within hip hop through my craft as well yeah. and be tied to sports and music culture. It's a blessing to be a barber, man. Yeah. You see so many things. So, so you know, finding to, to take that back to where it was, finding identity was a hard thing. Yeah. You know, because you're told a lot of the times in your life, based on how you spoke, how you look, mm -hmm. you're told how you're supposed to act, or how you're supposed to sound, right. or how you're supposed to walk. And I don't believe in that. Mm -hmm. I know who I am. You couldn't make me question it, no matter what. And I live in that. I, I, I would live in that every day. Right. I like that. I love that. You know, I'm a, hell, I'm an opponent of that. You feel me? Um, throughout your moments of growth into who you are today, right? When did you first have your aha moment? Like, oh, I'm doing exactly what I'm supposed to do. You, you know what I'm saying? Like, was it a specific person that you got the opportunity to cut? Or what was it like? Man, an aha moment for me comes every day. Mm -hmm. Every day there's an aha moment. You know, because every day you could, is, is a day that you could be knocked off your pivot. Mm -hmm. Every day is a day that someone can knock you off of your journey and put you on a different path. So my aha moments come every day. Every day I see something to remind me that I'm in the right direction where I'm supposed to be at. Yeah. I move off of energy. I move off of what God tells me. So, you know, an aha moment. All right, this is an aha moment. Yeah. I grew up in North Carolina. I'm sitting here talking to Cam Newton. Aha moment. I'm in the present. But an aha moment in my life, um, a big moment for me, a couple big moments. There's three really big moments that, that shifted a lot for me in my career, which I'm proud to say that I've accomplished. You know, the first one was uh, getting the key to my city in Fayetteville, what? Um, North Carolina. Uh, that was very important. And my brother Grant, you know, is, in, is on set and he, you know, we do a nonprofit. Uh, event that we do every Christmas, Vic Blanche Christmas give back. Um, so I've been giving back to my hometown the first year that I ever made $200,000. Mm. I, I said, man, we got to go do something. So being able to receive the key to your city is a very special moment. Right. Uh, and it's very wholesome, you know, when you're when you, having your whole fam there and having your, your people there and being able to put on for something positive was really important right. and to do something different. So that moment for me was very heavy. And a moment after that that I knew Okay, I got a chance here to do something on my voice that, like I said, we never seen before. I got to interview Roger Goodell for the NFL draft. Mm. Um, was it a year ago, two a year ago? Last year, last NFL draft. Mm -hmm. I interviewed Roger Goodell. And man, that was a powerful one. Mm. Like I really went in there with my head strong. I didn't fold on what I believed in and I asked questions that I felt were gonna matter for our community. Right. And that for me was a really big moment to show that, you know, I got a lot more power in my voice than I probably think I do. So, so when you, and I'm asking you for a follow-up, when you say my community, what community are, like, describe that outpour to what? For me, when I say my community, specifically in my head, I always go to Fayetteville, North Carolina, mm -hmm. but then I always come right back to Atlanta. Mm -hmm. When I say my community, I mean true middle class 
you know, love is love in my community. I you never discriminate against somebody for what they look like, right. what they rep, or where they come from. In my community is anybody that truly feels like they planted in what they're supposed to be doing. Right. The reason why I ask that is this. It's like we're at a standstill of humanity because if you don't look like me, you can't cope with me, mm. right? I see, I see your team, right? And minorities from a degree of uh, um, females or any type of descent of Asian, Mexican, uh, Colombian, African American, doesn't matter, right? My biggest thing of hate, when you talk about prejudiceness, sexism, uh, racism, things like that, the first thing that I think stems from that is not knowing, right? But when I see the content, when I kind of ease the, the, the transition and say, damn, like this dude, a cool dude, like you don't see or you don't look at the outer form of that person. Like what's your, what's your piercing kind of connectivity to individuals, no matter how they look, no matter how they talk, where they came from or just on the third? I think the thing that connects is the heart. Mm. I think everybody's hard to connect, honestly. If you really get a chance to connect it to somebody, mm -hmm. I think anybody could connect. But I think, you know, humans are naturally prejudiced, yes. So it's survival instinct to try to figure out who you're talking to before you actually talk to them. You're trying to be safe. So for a lot of people, they think safe looks one way. But I know safe is in the heart. And if somebody can show me their heart, I know if I'm safe or not. You're right. So I think being on the streets and connecting with people through haircuts shows my heart. And I don't know who these people are. I don't. Right. I wish, hey man, look, sometimes I do wish I scripted on they yeah, look. Yeah, yeah, Cause yeah, yeah. you know, you, I just take whoever's sitting in my chair. Mm -hmm. I just take whoever's sitting in my chair and I take them for whatever they've been through, for whatever they're going through, for whoever they are. I have no idea who these people are, but I want to show that it doesn't matter. Cause at the end of the day, who don't love a crispy right. lineup? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah, like, who yeah, don't yeah. love a good conversation? Who mm -hmm. don't love to know, to be asked how your day was? Man, being asked how you're feeling is one of the most important questions somebody could ever hear. Mm -hmm. So, being able to ask that to somebody that probably never even thought they would hear from somebody that looked like me or sound like me or whatever, whatever they might think I am before they speak to me, that's why I like looking like this. Mm -hmm. I'm art, you know, take me for what you think I am, man. Yeah. Whatever you think I am, sure. I know who I am, bro. Like you can't, you that. couldn't knock it off me. So, so all content, all content doesn't necessarily make the cut, so to speak. And as the person who we see now, the content that we see now isn't always where it came from. Give me the dark side, not necessarily the dark side. I don't want you to just sit up here and fabricate a story of this what happened. But every every person don't always want to cut. You know what I'm saying? Every person don't always want to talk. So for you, what's that transition like when you're trying to do good, but it's, it's, it's pushed away because of that defense mechanism? Well, I think when I create art, it looks however the person wants it to look. I didn't cut Roger Goodell. Mm. I sat there and talked to him like a man. You know, there's a lot of people that sit in my chair that don't want to cut. We don't have to have a cut. That's not what I'm trying to do. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to connect two humans. And if you don't want to hear it, my brother, do you got five minutes to talk to me? Mm. Can I get some advice from you? Could you tell me something that I might need to hear? Those are things that I think about if it's like no cut, because I really, dude, I'd rather just talk, honestly. Yeah. I love to cut, don't get me wrong, but if a cut is what it takes to have a convo, that's the only way we could talk, then I don't want it to be limited to that. Yeah. So I can imagine now, yo, if somebody didn't want to, you know, I might do a public cut, bro, and say nothing the whole time. Mm. Just to show somebody that sometimes when you go to the barbershop, it's not always for a talk. Some people need just a cut, and they need to just be listened to, or they just need to be shared, and they just need to share energy. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you don't want to talk, but sharing energy could be really important for you. So sometimes, you know, I've been to the shop and they want to say a word, but I got what I needed. Right. So I, I would, I would say that, you know, there, there's some videos that don't make the cut for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But if it doesn't go my way, it doesn't mean it's not the right way to go. Mm -hmm. And I just follow whatever is happening in that moment. Absolutely. So here we go. We got a, a sector of this interview where we play a game, and it's called Barber Flops. 
<laughs> I hate it. So I just need a simple clean fade, right? A little off the top, but some folks. Oh, this are... is what you're telling me. Is this like you sitting in my chair right now? I'm trying. Come on, let me. If take you sitting you in the chair. Right? Let me. Let me hear. Let me let listen. Me, let me take you there, right? Take yeah. So uh, some folks are missing a few screws off the top. This game is called Barber Flops. I'm going to show you images of wacky hairstyles from the, off the internet. Describe to us what you think happened Ooh. in the conception of these haircuts and the timeliness it takes for these hair designs to be created. iPad, sir. Yeah, they showed me some wild, they showed me some wicked stuff on this iPad so, earlier, man. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna show you an image and right off the top, tell me what you think. Ready? What I think? What you want, bro? Tell me, cause I'll tell you what I think off the top of my head. Tell me what you think, but also tell me the whole process of how did they come to this? To this situation, all right, how we got here? Say less. Cool, say Ready? no more. Here we go. Mm. Beijing strong. Too strong. Mm. Too strong. Somebody needs to. Somebody needs a diff, Someone needs a real conversation. It needs to be a real conversation in this chair. That's not happening. That's what's not happening is a real conversation. Mm. Someone sat in the chair and bamboozled a barber to doing that. How long does it take Beijing to kind of sit in? Uh, I mean, man, that's like you gotta know, like that right there is um. That might be like six, six, that might be like six hours, good six hours if you don't touch it. And I'm talking about like how would it last? How, that's what I'm about to say. Because how long would how it last? Long how will long it, it last? Because you won. How long would it last? Hot that car. Now nah, that, man, he put his shirt on wrong, it's gonna be done. It's smeared. Smeared it. Like, if he put he put his shirt on wrong, it's just, yeah, you don't need to move. He mm. need to come with his, if he was getting married, he need to come with a suit on. <laughs> you feel me? Already. He can't even. Dog, don't, don't even move. shake your head too hard. You can't even sneeze. Mm, nah. Sauce already on foe. Don't even sneeze. Don't even touch your face. Here we go. Next one. Oof. I ain't gonna lie. I low-key like this. Take me through it. I think it's creative. But we got braids coming through the front. I think it's just creative. Look at the beard though. Look at the look at the chop up the lines through the beard. Like that's the the, the chin strap. I know the error because this is chin strap. You know, I know when they was rocking chin straps. Mm -hmm. He fresh though. Look, the what's mustache the, is lined. What's the upkeep with this? He might have to lay the bangs down to get them really like, cause that's in, that is intentional. Mm -hmm. Look, them, them curves right there and them bangs ain't. That's not accidental. He laid them. He but, laid them, but he did something to them. But do you wear a stocking cap or a wave? Do you probably yeah. You gonna want to do rag that. You gonna want to yeah. You gonna want to lay down. You know, especially fresh braids. You gonna want to do rag anytime. If you go to sleep with fresh braids, it's just, you know, you're going to wake up a little fuzzy. You know? It's given. So, okay. So I think, yeah, I think that, I mean, yeah, eyebrows are straight too. I'm peeping everything. Look, the eyebrows, <laughs> dummy straight. Dummy. Dummy straight. Mm, this is tough. The swirl. Call this the, uh, the pecan swirl. It's a rose. Call that, man. Ooh. Ro pecan, rose pecan. Pecan rose. Mm. Hold on, we're going to get there. We're going to call that the pecan rose. How long will a, 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 a style like this? That's one and done. That's a style. That's a hard style. Someone, someone put hours into that for sure. But that's not nothing. You ain't. That's not regular. You're not. That's not a day to day. No way you're day to day with that. You can't. You got to go peak. That's a pecan rose night. Why? Right. It's just not logical. You wouldn't be able to. That's something a person can't go home and replicate. Feel me? He well, needs somebody to do that. How much will a, a hairstyle like this cost? Some, you need people, jail, some people you will need... never get that. To some people, it may be priceless. Mm. What is it worth to you? Would you get that? I don't even think my hair grade could even allow me to have that safely. <sighs> my roots. Nah, probably not. You could probably do it, but not safely for sure. Yeah. Not safely. Let's go. Ooh. Now they slicing. See, they it's slicing. This is sharp. This is sharp, but this is, you know, when you look at this, you got to know what you're looking at. But then the details with the blonde, I did, I had a phase of the, the I called it the chicken nugget with the blonde. Like you dip a chicken nugget in there, you know what I mean? It was honey mustard. Yeah, for sure. I see what you're saying. Yeah, you know I'm saying, but you have to, like, that. Dog, right you got to peep, look, I'm going to tell you what I peep. You got to peep that structure on the back of that head. You see that line on mm. the back of that? You see from the neck going up straight, how it formulates that, that square right there at the top? Right. Like right here, like, like that shape. Mm. 
Mm. That shape right oh, yeah, there. Yeah, it's flat. That creates silhouette. Like this is man, this is uh this is a look. Same thing. Like this is uh they trying to be on a front cover or steady, something. Steady, steady hand. All that. It's technique. The upkeep of this is how long, how many days could this last? Nah, that ain't lasting. Like that style right there, to do that style with the points and the lines and, and how they, that style, it's all like a lot of hairspray, a lot of, you know, your rat tail comb and you picking and pulling and it's a style. Somebody put hours into it. Now the fade and the cut, that might only look good. I'm gonna be honest, it might only look good for a good two days. Mm. That's like, a cut like that with that many lines in it, it's like a 48 hour. For real, it's just too Life, many. Lifespan. It's only 48, yeah, first 48 on a cut like that. First 48. Yeah, because it's just too many lines. The fade is too intricate. The second that it starts to grow out, it's, it's not going to look good growing out. Say less. We wow. got a whole movement. I don't know if this is a peacock. What is that? It's looking like... I don't even. It's know. like Grinch type, but that's not Grinch. Nah, it's like a little gotta, scarier than that. She got a. a Those vid. are feet. There's a there's a there's a flower and a, uh, there's a feather. Yeah. I'm trying to think, what is it though? And then like so with dye, what's the dye effect to and your? I don't cut your, the hair. Your so natural I, roots. You got to know the you you have to know the hair texture. You got to know the hair type. That mm -hmm. is a big issue with hair. Mm -hmm. Is you gotta understand the hair type of what you're working with. Mm. And that's important for you know cosmetologists and barbers or people that do hair, right. especially the hair that's outside of a of a, of a style that you would normally have. Right. Like you have a totally different texture than me. Correct. Totally different wave pattern than me. It's a totally different type of hair. Do you learn that at school or you learn that? that? You're supposed to learn that. Mm. Now, if, does everybody pay attention to things like that? Then you know that might be the difference in a in a really, really great barber and a barber that's really good. Mm. But you wanna be great, you gotta know the textures that you're working with. And how they react to certain things like color, heat, uh, you know, razor blade, skin. You got to know the skin, right? Skin of your client is important. Because mm -hmm. more than anything, it's sometimes not the hair, but it's the skin of who you're dealing with. Because right. you have to know. I could dig it. So that. And not to mention the little red up underneath, too. Yeah. Rainbow shouting. Mm. Mm. Somebody Someone got auntie. in a bag. Auntie in her bag. Like, who convinced Auntie to do this? Oh. I hope she really wanted this one. But she got the eyeball. But like, but it's like those hair details. This is a hair show. Like this isn't a hair show. Bronner Brothers hair show, they yeah. gonna knock, man, you see this on stage? Yeah. They gonna perform with this. Someone's gonna do this on stage. So is bro. that one wig or multiple wigs on top of it? See, now this isn't like, you know, a, a, a territory. I don't really know. I gotta, you know. But what, it's but a, a wig on top for sure. It's a wig, you know, a wig that's cut on top, but it's also like, it's a situation like that where it's not really a wig, but it's a creation. Like when you go on set for a movie mm. and they got to create you something, and like, yo, somebody, some talented, talented hair artist took a wig already or natural hair and molded and made that. Like that's art. You look at that, that's art. Like somebody made a whole eye out the back with eyelashes yeah. in the back of a bob with the color laid on the pink. Like that's a phenomenal job. Like. Auntie still. Yeah, Auntie stepping with that. So if if you had to give me one of these that you Ooh. had to personally step out with, which one would it be? You had, had to wear to you had one. to wear one of these for a month. Which one would you choose? Ah oh, man. I'm definitely going top right. Now I'm just playing. I'm going, <laughs> I'm going, I'm going, I'm going, I'm going right there. I'm going in the middle to the right. Right here? Beard, yeah. But I don't even have a beard. The only, there's nothing I mean, damn. If I could pick one, I could have the hair, right? Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to go center row, right side. Right, right. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to take the beard. Give me a little. You going to stick out Give me a little suave now. up top. Give me some suave up top and yeah. some hard lines and good fat. Like, yeah, that's Say probably that. what I would go for. Which one would you want to cut? Which one would I want? I would probably want, I could. Which one would I want to cut? That is a dangerous question. <laughs> yeah. But you but they be wanna, like, man, Vic, I want this. Cause look, I don't want to cut everything. That's the thing. Mm. I just don't want to do that. That is a big that's a big responsibility. Respond yeah, sometimes someone's asking you to do something that you just don't want to do. What is it? The shade room, what I asked for versus what I got? Yeah, like yo, I don't have people sitting in the chair and ask me for some like some things that I just had to say I just won't do yeah. that. My brother, like, I can't. 
You're walking around with my work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? But even, even to that, take me through the disappointments in the chair. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Have you ever had to reimburse somebody their money yeah, back? you got to earn your stripes, man. Like, barbering, again, like, I, I'm not, a, I would so say a, a barber anymore. Barber, I'm a barber, man. Mm -hmm. But you had to earn, I had to earn them stripes in that chair. Mm -hmm. And it's been a while since I done had, like, situations like this happen. Right. But, man, yeah, like, I don't had people come to the, man, come to the garage with no money, knowing they had no money. And, like, getting cuts and walking out, like, or getting, like, all right, how much a cut? Cut is 10. No one they got five. Get the whole cut and say, yo, I only got, I got five. You said it was five, right? I'm like, I said it was five. What are we doing? It was 10. I ain't never charged five. I always charged 10. I didn't charge money till I knew I could charge 10. So I didn't, when I first started cutting, I didn't even charge nobody for the first four months. It took me four months before I felt like I could compete with a dude that was charging 10. Mm. So I wouldn't, get, I wouldn't even give nobody, I wouldn't even take $5 from somebody. I waited till I could charge 10. So I know that's not even true. Oh, wow. Because I'm like, bro, I've been giving free haircuts out to the whole neighborhood for four months trying to get my, my reps in. Right. He came to the shop with five and got up and was like, yeah, it's five, right? I'm like, Dang. you got to just like, you got, but you got to learn as you a barber, you got to know when to pick and choose, especially when you're in your place of business. Although I was in my mama's garage, mm -hmm. I'm in a place of business. Right. You ain't want to bring that in. So I'm not like, you know, I'm like, you know what, bro? I said it was 10, but you good, bro? Go ahead. But you right. fire clients. This is never going to see me again. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I could dig it. So I asked you a question. I asked you a question um, off camera. And I want to kind of come back to it with what did COVID teach you? Right? COVID was, or the pandemic was a time where, I mean, it was a lot of folks rough. You know what I mean? And as a barber, having a face-to-face -face transaction, a human-to-human -human transaction, like you don't get the luxury of, of, of selling e-commerce. You know what I'm saying? You don't get the, the effect to, do, to sell business virtually. Like you need to be in the presence of a person to get your coin or your capital. Like throughout, throughout that time, how were you able to stay afloat? My situation during the pandemic was... Life changing. The pandemic absolutely changed my life. Um, and I would say now, looking back at it for the better, but in that time it was hard mm. to understand that something this, of this magnitude, like I'll make it out on the other side of this and be greater than what I went, in, what I went into. Right. Because I, I think for the whole world, we all went into the pandemic with a plan. And that plan, uh, you thought you had a plan coming into the pandemic. Right, right. And it, you know, we, it, got, it got brought out, so you got to readjust. So the pandemic forced me to look within and to readjust and redefine who Victor Fontenis actually is. Mm -hmm. And for me, I, I was, I've always been an entrepreneur first before anything. So I've had an online academy since I started my barbering career in mm -hmm. Fayetteville, and I built this online academy for $1,500 in my mom's house. Mm -hmm. So I've been teaching online and, and making e-commerce before I was really making a lot of money cutting hair. Right. Like I was making a good amount of money cutting hair, but I knew to, to, to not limit my income to one facet. So teaching for me was prominent early in my career to teach. I've always been a teacher and, and, and a leader in that aspect. So I was teaching online and had an online academy, VicBlends.com, since the start of my career. Mm -hmm. So in the pandemic, I wasn't really pursuing it, but it gave me a chance to look within, not at the online academy, but to look at who Victor Fontenez is if I can never cut hair again. Right. That was a real situation where I had to ask myself, who am I? And the quote that changed my life in the midst of the pandemic was, don't let what you're good at define who you are. Mm. Who are you if you can't do what you're good at? So when you think that you Hold are- Hold on, say, oh, say that one more time, because that, that, that's some right there. That's heavy. Yeah, don't let what you're good at define who you are. Mm -hmm. Who are you if you can't do what you're good at? Yeah. So I had to sit there and think, man, the whole world loved me for this haircut. Everybody. It's the only thing they ask for, for, for when they see me is a haircut. Now, haircutting is a gift. These hands is a gift. This body is a gift from God. Right. God forbid, knock on some wood, man. If I ever, you know, if I ever can't get to that gift, what else I got to offer to the world? Right. And I had to sit there and really think about that. It was a, it's probably a question we all think about, but not as frequent as you think. And when the pandemic took my opportunity to do the one thing that I thought I was great at, I had to really look within and look to God and say, what else do I got in store for me? You got to adjust. So I started 
speaking more in the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And speaking for me was something that I tried in Fayetteville, but didn't have the confidence or the belief that it could ever come from somebody like me. I didn't think anybody wanted to hear it from me, to be mm -hmm. honest with you, bro. There ain't no way someone wanted to hear motivation from a, from a kid from Fayetteville, North Carolina. That's, just a you know, white kid, you know what I'm yeah, like, just, just keep it a book. You, you know, know, I didn't, it was a lot. You know, so I let that, I let, you know, I let the noise stop me, mm. bro, from fulfilling my purpose. I let the noise stop me for a little bit. Right. Because I'm just like, man, I don't, man, I want to do this. I believe in I'm going to do this. And they said, they told me to shut up and keep cutting hair. Right. I'm like, man, all right, I'm going to just keep doing that. I'm great at that. And then God showed me like, man, if you can't do that, what you going to do? Right. And I went back to what I knew I was always put on this earth to do and I wanted to use my voice. So when I started speaking during the pandemic, it gave me a chance to realize that I had more in store. And that I wasn't going to be limited to this gift that could be taken from me at any day. Right. So when I started putting videos out of me speaking during the pandemic, slowly but surely, you'll see, I start to see momentum. Mm -hmm. Not momentum as well. Wow, oh, people like this. I'm going to keep doing this because people like this. But I saw momentum in my own life. I saw that I had more to offer to somebody than a cut. And that meant something to me. So when we came out of that pandemic, and I knew I had a chance to get back out there with my clippers and do something with it, I knew I wasn't going to be chasing the next rapper again. I knew I wasn't going to be chasing the next celebrity or the next athlete. I knew I was going to go do something that I felt was going to really change something for my life and others. And I knew that speaking to people on the streets and using my voice was going to be the thing. So when I got out of that pandemic, man, I straight to the streets with it, oh, brought wow. my chair and brought everything with me and just walked out on faith, man. And man, it, I, I would do it if, uh, if nobody saw him. Yeah. You know, that that's why I know it's the right thing for me because I would I do it every day if nobody even sees it. I like that. So take me through the you got it on right now, plant it, right? Like a clothing line that you created. Um and to the viewer, how could how could they get it and where did it, where did it derive from? Can't even get it right now. I wish I could get it to them. Yeah. I just started it. It's mm -hmm. not even sound I'm really starting, it's just how I live. Like for me, being planted is, is everything. And it's funny because I actually started to build a brand before that. And the brand before that was called More. And I, I believe in that thing so much, I got it tatted across my stomach. Mm. That's how much I really believe in what I was doing. But you see how loud that is? Right. You see how big that is? Right. Because at that time of my life, when I thought I needed more, I really needed less. And I thought getting more in my life because I wanted to reach that point where I would be the first one in my family, like you said earlier, to change the lineage. Mm -hmm. I was fighting for more every day. I needed everything. Man, when you come from a place like Favor, North Carolina, and you come from having a family that has been through things that like my family has been through, like my dad is the one that changed my lineage, actually. Mm -hmm. You know, to join the military, he, he broke everything. For real, just joining the military broke everything because he gave me a chance to... Uh, to just be creative and be myself. So I thought I just needed more. I, I wanted more so bad, Cam. Like I was, every day I need more, I need everything. And I came to realize that, you know, having more doesn't really satisfy or fulfill what you, what you probably really need. And truly being planted in within, truly being planted within what you believe in is the most important thing. Yeah. And being rooted within your purpose because it's not about where you came from and it's not about even knowing your next step, because mm. both those things are irrelevant. It's about knowing what you got to do today. Right. And I think as long as you know what you got to do today, you're planted. It don't matter what you've been through, bro. It don't matter how who you think you are, the trauma we've been, man, it don't matter. It's done. Right. Like what matters is I know what today, I know what I got to do today. So it's the purpose behind planting. Yeah. You feel me? So that's I why it. I went real small. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> but on prime real estate. Real small, I'm prime yeah. real estate. Because I knew, man, like being planted is just, it's just who I am, bro. So I'm gonna take this, I'm gonna take this time, you know, with the remaining time that we got, bro. And I wanna we, just we running out of time? I want bro. No. But I want you to use your platform to ask me your questions. Oh, please, bro. You see what I'm saying? First, can I just give you your flowers? Come on. Uh, can it. I please, bro? And yeah. I don't even know how you feel. Um, because sometimes like, and maybe people don't think about this, but it's not really even natural for a human to be praised as much as you, as you, as you get when you become somebody seen on, on a, on a level that you've seen. So I don't really know how you feel about praise or being on camera like this. So right. I just want you to know it's coming from my heart, but 
Like we grew up in North Carolina favor. And I grew up not a Carolina Panthers from my dad from Boston, so I grew up a Patriots fan. Mm-hmm. But seeing you come to Carolina and do what you did for the whole state, like I'm trying to hold back tears, bro, because yeah, yeah, you don't yeah. even know, like, yo, bro, I watch you flip into the end zone, bro, every day on Sunday, like, like yeah, I watch yeah. you flip into the end zone, bro, I watch you, like, for yeah. real, every day, Superman. Was I a Carolina Panther fan? Nah. Mm. Did I talk shit about you every Sunday? Hell yeah. Right. Because, damn, this dude Mookie, who we gonna love, I said, Michael Staples, bro. This dude that ran cross country me was your number one fan. Mm-hmm. And he would run through his races and go like that, ah, on right. my head every Sunday, bro. So seeing your impact that not only you had through the league at that time, but in North Carolina, yeah. to be a North Carolina native, and to work in a sports bar at that time, and every football Sunday when we had 50 cent wings, and I knew this shit was gonna be packed, but I knew everybody was in there for Cam Newton. Like, bro, you are one of the greatest to ever play the game. And I don't, man, I don't, I'm not even into sports. Mm-hmm. So it really is irrelevant to what anybody would ever have to say about you. Cause I know the impact that you had on Carolina. Yeah. Yo, it ain't that, man. You in the books, bro. Yeah. <laughs> Especially in my book, man. Like, I'm just honored to be able to share a moment mm. and to be able to tell you how much your impact, in not only the state of North Carolina, but growing up and seeing you just do it all from the JUCO route to D1 to the league to, yo, we watched you, you know, bro, we was able to watch you beat it all. Bro, like, thank you. Right? Like for me, people have to understand like, I'm so at peace. You know what I'm saying? Like, do I want to go back to the NFL? Hell yeah. Do I understand that that's a very prestigious fraternity? Absolutely. But what's more important to me is impact. You know what I'm saying? Like, I care about people. I care about really having the say-so to a person and know, like, bro, I care. You know what I'm saying? And I may be different to you, but I'm here. Like, I like I woke up this morning. I may not have the money. I may not have the fame. I may not have this. But, bro, I'm going to pick up this trash right here. That's me changing my community. So I want to ask you. Very difficult question, as I ask myself all the time, because mm-hmm. I believe you will be back in the league. I believe you're going to, I believe it's not done, honestly. Mm-hmm. And I want to ask you, who is Cam Newton if Cam Newton can never play the game again? Couldn't wait, right? Um, bro, I'm a trailblazer. Mm. I'm an opportunist. And... I'm a chameleon. You put me in the jungle, I'm gonna be a lion. You put me in the ocean, I'm gonna be a shark. You feel me? You put me in the business room, I'm gonna be an executive. And life taught me that. Being isolated from the fortune and the fame, it it taught me how to adapt. Having things, you kind of grow to, to, to say, okay, I like this. I like this type of lifestyle. But the thing with this lifestyle that you have to understand, you have to adapt to certain things. The thing that I was, you asked me what I was doing at 24. The thing that I was into at 24, I'm not into when I'm 33. I have seven children. I'll, I take every opportunity to, to, to share my story. And when you start having children, the smile on their, those smiles on their faces is just like, daddy, daddy, look, daddy, look. When I was 22, I didn't know if I even needed that validation. So I could be in the airport with my children. I could be out to dinner with my family. I could be wherever in day-to-day life. And I say to myself, or somebody may come up to me and they say, yo, Cam, can I get a picture? And I'd be like, bro, I'm not, no, not right now, bro. I'm daddy right now. And if they were to reply, but it's just real quick, real quick. It's not going to take us long. I'm like, bro, I'm daddy. If they leave there, saying to themselves, man, 
camp. You know, it is what it is. Like, damn, I just asked for a picture. But to me, it's like that doesn't matter because my son knows that I'm present with him. I'm giving him my time. I'm giving him my energy because to the world, yeah, Cam Newton, Superman, all that dab. But to him, I'm trying to build a strong individual man amongst others, just like I'm trying to raise my daughters, too. So I don't I couldn't even tell you where my national championship ring is. I couldn't I could care less where my Heisman trophy is. I could care less where my first check of the NFL was. What I do care about is how did I make people feel? So I felt the passion when you stood up, you know what I'm saying? And that's all I ever wanted. Like when I play football or when I do Funky Friday, I want people to look through and say, whether I like them or, or hate them, I still know it's genuine. And if I'm able to give my genuine energy to a person and they say like, damn bro, like I love that about him. Cause I'm not changing. I done been faced with all type. I done been broke as before. I done been rich as before too. And I choose rich over anything, but to what degree? What did I sell? Did I sell my soul? I'm still my same self where it's like, I don't care how much that car costs. I don't care how much that experience costs. If I'm not able to share it with people who I love and adore, it's not even worth it. You know what I'm saying? I done overpaid for experiences and not pay for experiences, not because of the price point, but just the, the exposure. And I think that's what maturity has taught me. How do, you, how do you have confidence, not just confidence, but how do you have so much confidence in being yourself, being where you're from, to be a chameleon, when I'm sure it's hard, mm -hmm. even have to, to have to play a role as a quarterback, or even have to be, because that was a big thing that I remember watching you was, Yo, everybody would talk about all this, mm -hmm. all this. Right. Like the dad, they hate, man. Look, I, how do you have so much confidence to say that this is who I am and it won't change? I'll express this because I'm sure it didn't start when you got to the NFL. I'm sure it started in your community first. It started in a dark place. All right, I found myself in junior college. And what junior college taught me is alienation is not a bad thing. A lot of people are in this noisy world, but they can't find solitude, mm -hmm. right? Before we even, um, before I even came out, I meditated because I just want to make sure I check my energy, right? And I, I, I have to identify like, yo, I'm not, I'm not okay. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about something that has nothing to do with Vic, has nothing to do with the set, but I'm tapping into myself. And I think what taught me confidence is being boldly transparent with yourself because you can never tell me something that I haven't already told myself. Everybody, whether they see this, ha can never say Skip Bayless, Shannon Sharp, uh, uh, whatever, Molly Karam. Like, they could never, Stephen A., they could never tell me something that I haven't questioned or said to myself. So once I talk to myself, not in third person, but in first person and say, yo, bro, like, they saying you washed up. Damn, bro, they saying that you can't throw it. They saying you inaccurate. I've already told myself that and I use that as fuel to say, bro, you gotta be better. So when I'm, when I'm going through these different stages of my life, very vulnerable stages where nobody really can cope with it, and I'll even tell you this, it's like, I had to raise myself. And that's a different type of feeling. Like I was the first millionaire in my whole City, really. Not even in my last name, like my city. And for a long time, it's a lot of people that, yeah, you know, you, are, you, you in Atlanta now, it's like you see people, people got money. But it's like the type of money that I see and I have, it's like, bro, you got to protect that. So who can I go to when I'm like, yo, yo, partner, hey, man, I just got hit with 175000 And guess what? Next week, I'm going to get... 225,000. Bro, I just got a sign of bonus of six million motherfucking dollars. They gonna send me 3.2 mil next week. Who can you go to when they can't cope with you? So I had to raise myself with that. So as I'm growing, and when I first got into the league, nobody looked like me. The bold, the, yeah, they were my, it was Michael Vick, it was Donovan McNabb, but I was unapologetically myself. So 
the Peyton Mannings, the Aaron Rodgers, the Tom Brady's, that's who they worship and they still do and rightfully so. How, how, how hard is it for you to find mentorship through your journey as things are elevating and you're not just elevating in, in terms of like, oh, you're making a lot of money, but you're starting to experience things that not a lot of people can experience. Mm -hmm. And that goes for everybody because everybody is going through something that is very unique to their life. Right. How do you find your outlet to either get your advice or to cope with these things as new things are happening to you that you've never been through? Man, everybody's different, but you have to identify what's your reset button. What's your boiling point and what's your reset? So like when you have an anxiety and, and I'm praying for Jamie Foxx, Right? Praying for just Jamie Foxx, man. Pull through Jamie for real. You know, just had a stroke. But I use that as an example where anybody who's going through stress, we deal with it differently. Like, I'm, I, I, I need to be alienated from everything. My children, my family, my everything. I just go on walks and I just, whether I don't even really like listening to music. I just listen to ambient sounds. Because it it, it it grounds me again, right? I take my shoes off, and I'm one of those guys that just like, bro, I want to feel the earth. Like, God, I, I want to show so much gratitude in this type of moment. And once you find out that boiling point, now you have to also find out what's your reset button. I, I just took my first break of my life. You know what I'm saying? I just took my first, I had my first real breakdown mm -hmm. and took my first real break. I haven't done a public, I just did my first public haircut. It's been four months, I waited until mm. April to do it. Like I, I, took, I had to take that break, just like you saying. But that's important. Because it's important, I know how important it is now. No I couldn't talk. see it, bro. I couldn't see it. Like people need, to make it, man. People need charge. And when, you, when, when your battery is red, when, oh, first off, when your battery is yellow, you have to start identifying it like, okay, I, I, I got about 60 miles until I'm empty. I got about three or four days until I'm going, I'm going, I'm going to go crazy, right? <laughs> Once you know that, you can start warranting yourself to protect yourself. And like I say now, I protect myself from people. I got to protect my energy. And I got to make sure when I come on stage, I have to make sure when I went out there on the field that I was in that right frame of mind to put on a performance, whether good, bad, or indifferent, I can go to sleep at night. Is your pregame for football different than your pregame now? And let's say like, all right, boom, Kim, you got a big media opportunity and you got a big game. Mm -hmm. Does your pregame for things that you do now in your career as far as, oh, I'm gonna go close this deal, it, is, it your pre is, it, is it the same pregame or how does your pregame adapt? It, run, it runs vertical to itself, right? Like, and even when I was playing, when I first wake up, that was my, that was my tap into myself way, right? I would listen to, you know, meditation music. I will, I'm big on faith, big on religion. I'm Christian and I would listen to gospel music and I would tap into like just the gratitude, like Father God, I just want to thank you for this, this platform that you've given me. You know, I don't, I don't want to ever take this day to not give you all the praise and glory and let today turn out how you want it, not me. I'm just a vessel, you know what I mean? And then as I'm going to, as I'm going to the stadium or as I'm like taking on that type of energy because you, you take on the fans' energy, right? You know, cam, 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 blah, 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 blah. Do you start taking the energy as soon as you walk in? Oh, of course. Is that, gotta, do, gotta do, are present. you ready? Okay, so when you hit the stadium, you're already ready. It's, it's I'm, I'm, I'm locked in. But now that, that music genre changes to like, bro, I can get dark real quick. And, and a lot of people don't know, like I have anger issues. I don't, I don't show it. That's not cool for me to show it. And I think it's immature sometimes. But I, when, when I was, when we would lose, everybody would say, man, Cam, I'm so loser. But I've always battled with, like I'm mad, like rage. Like I don't give a about you. When like, you lose though? Lose, like I'm a competitive person. Where's it coming from though? Like where's the anger at? It, it, I feel nobody's doing what I was doing, but I was playing in a team sport that, that had so many determining factors, right? So if I was a, a, a tennis player, if I was a track runner, if I was a, you know, a, a, a boxer, it's easy for me to put more on me 
I ran, I did individual sports. Mm -hmm. I never played football in my life. I never played basketball in my line of team. Right. I only ran track, cross country, which is like cross country team, all team sport, but individual, like I'm running. And I competed for boxing. Mm. So, uh, you know, I ran cross country. That was my main sport in boxing. You run it by yourself. Nobody's right. running for you. Nobody's getting in the ring either for me and punching for me. Right. Like, it's, you not, you, there's no, like, there's no, we always joke on football players mm -hmm. and the basketball players because there's no bench even in cross country. Like, as soon as that gun hit and you got to run 3.2 miles as fast as you can, you know, that bell ring, coach can't hold no mitts no more. Like, nobody is, no headgear. I mean, you know, there's headgear, but it's like, you know, hey, it's, it's loose. So, right. individual sports for me was my thing. So, I couldn't, I mean, I can't even fathom what it would feel like to uh, be so, I'm so team evolved now. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about the competitive space. Right. I work, I work in, a, in an isolation, I would say, for myself. So, so I, I, like, I'll tell you this. So it's no different than sports to actual um, real life because I've lost games off of somebody else's mistake. You know what I'm saying? But you can't look at it like somebody else's mistake, you, right? You, you, you can't, can. but that's what I'm saying. There's so many different determining factors of that. That's the, po that's the negative. The positive is I've won also on somebody's greatness. So I'll give you an example. When I was in Carolina, uh, the first game of the 2016 year, uh, Graham Gano missed the field goal. And that was, that was the kickoff game for the Denver Broncos. It was kind of going to be like the payback, right? Because we lost the Super Bowl that year. Yeah. He missed the field goal, right? So that's, you, you're relying on somebody else to, you know, the outcome of the game. Wow. But also, I'll say this, that same kicker, that same player, he kicked a 63-yard game winner versus the New York Giants, I think, like a year after that. But he missed for you, though. But he, but wow. he, missed, he missed one game. <laughs> he missed one game, yeah. but he made another kick that made us win. So it's like you got to weigh it all. It's team. Wow. You see what I'm saying? So it's like you can't just throw on him and be on like. On a one situation, it's like. Right. You because he's one, he, he won us the game, too. So even in life, yeah. like now, I'm looking at my team now. I'm like, yo, I got VJ, I got Waldo, I got Ashe, I got Peggy, I got BG. I'm like, these are my linemen. These are my receivers. These are my quarterbacks. These are my running backs. And even though they may have a bad day one day, you can't just say, man, to hell with Peggy. Like, he don't get it. Get rid of him, right? Because you got to pour into people. I wow. love people. And I'll try to teach them everything through what I've seen. And I have to have discernment to know, Cam, shut up, listen, right? And if I'm not in that, in that, in that headspace to receive, I have to remove myself so I can come back and receive. How do you, how do you love if you feel like you've never been loved? That's tough. That's a, that's a, that's a, that's a situation where you have to dabble in that for yourself. Drake has a line that, that says, how do you know who's for you when anybody will go with you? Mm, wow, that's reminds me. All right, we throwing quotes out. I remember Nelly, uh, you know, shout out to my uncle Nelly, man. He told me, um, loyalty is not when you, when, you, when you have no options and you stand next to somebody. Yeah. Loyalty is when you have options and then choose to stand next to somebody. Mm. That's survival, the first one. And I was like, wow. You know, and yeah. I asked him, I said, why would you say that? He said, um, you know, when we got no options, we all sit around broke. Like, and you, you know, you talking about I was there with you. It's like, yeah, we got nothing. Where else you going to go? <laughs> but when you got options and, and say, I choose to stand next to my brother, I choose to stand next to my sister, and I got every option in the world to go and do this and that and work with this or to go do this, when I choose next to stand next to you when I got options... That's how somebody's, that's how you know somebody's loyal. Absolutely. Man, listen, bro, we can keep going and going and going, man. And I appreciate your energy, bro. Man, I thank appreciate you, bro, your for insight. For accepting me in your home, bro. Yeah. And, and just bringing me in, bro. Mm hmm. So as we end things here on Funky Friday, man, we're going to go in unison. We're going to start with this camera right here. And then we're going to go to this camera right here. And then we're going to finish up with this camera. GB, bro. All right. It's time, right? You yeah. prepped me with this one, man. You got it? One finger? Hot, one finger. One pinky. One pinky. One thumb. One love, man. One love, baby. Mm, man. <laughs> yes, sir, man. Bro, thank you, bro. Appreciate you, thank bro. Thank you for everything, yes, bro. Yes, sir, man. 
It's, oh, whoa, 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 whoa. Hold on, we're not done. Hold on, where we at? Uh, Brenda, where we at with it? Brenda, we got, the, we got them ready? Yeah. You can't, look, you can't yeah. get it anywhere, but it's something I'm building, man. So I had to come with a, with a, with a, a care special. Care package. Right, yeah, okay. let me, say yeah, let me, yeah, let me make this, let me make this, this talk. Bro, you 2X or 3X, bro? I'm really an XL. I'm no, six. you not, bro. I like no, it. you, I man. I like it fitted, bro. No, 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 no. I like it fitted. But I'm a, fitted. No, listen, I just they, told they you, little, I will rock. Little. I will rock anything. So bro. look, it got to be a little oversized. Yes, sir. It got to be a little oversized. So I just got you, because they're going to string. These are just samples. Mm-hmm. I got. I wanted to get you, you know, your own shirts as well. Yes, sir. Two uh, X and three X, they both. Mm. In look, I didn't do it because everybody told me that yeah, Ken Newton pretty, you know, he a big dude. When you see him, I'm like, I just say, but we these. I'm like, shirts. I ain't, what, how big y'all talk? Like two X or three X? Yeah. I say, man, let's say both. Let's say both. So, yeah. uh, you know, I think, Appreciate bro, you, you represent the definition of what it means to be planted and mm. to be rooted within your purpose, uh, which is why I even created this in the first place and. I just thank you for welcoming me your home, bro, and, and allowing me to give you your flowers, but giving me mine at the same time. So thank Appreciate you, bro. You, yes, sir, Ski. It's so easy, man. Groupies! Let's go.